Since the very development of the atomic bomb, we've feared its mass proliferation and use becoming common in the wars of the world. The atom bomb's devastating capability to level cities was enough of a worry all its own, but then we came to learn how much worse the after effects could be, not merely salting the earth to make it infertile, but poisoning and mutating it along with anyone who survived the initial blast. It's pretty clear that these things are extremely dangerous, certainly not something you'd want falling into the wrong hands, and there's a lot of them out there. Russia has close to 7,000, the US 6,500, France 300, China 280, the UK 200, Pakistan 150, India 140, Israel who knows, and North Korea, again, who knows. Since the day Russia developed and tested their very first weapon and posed a challenge to the US hegemony over nuclear power, we've had a handful of rushes with near nuclear exchanges, and we eventually came to believe in idea of mutually assured destruction. That if so much as one nuke was fired on a land even remotely linked to a rival nuclear power, it would justify a total nuclear exchange, and in most cases, because of the alliance system, this would involve the arsenals of not only, say, the US and USSR, but their allies of Britain, France, Israel, and China. India and Pakistan are outliers in that they are somewhat removed from the alliance system, but today they have just enough importance to possibly justify action by the major powers if their animosity toward each other led to a nuclear exchange. Though it's also possible, because of again mutually assured destruction, that the major powers of the world may cut it off as an isolated incident which doesn't necessarily affect or concern them. This idea of mutually assured destruction has spawned fantasies and simulations of what effects a post-nuclear war might bring, ranging from Fallout to Metro, from Far Cry to Planet of the Apes. Oh crap, spoilers. Suffice to say, in most instances, there's a perception that nuclear war would absolutely destroy human civilization and potentially make us extinct. Little tidbits of information are even littered in fact videos about how our nuclear weapons could destroy the Earth multiple times over, which simply isn't true. The reality goes a little bit more like this. If the radius of every detonation was positioned just correctly, it would be less than the geographic size of the United States. Meaning if everyone, even our own arsenal, was turned against us, it would still not be enough to completely level the country. Theoretically, you could stretch this in a way to say that we have enough nukes to completely irradiate the planet, but that wouldn't exactly be destroying the planet itself, at least not in the way people tend to imagine it. Carpet bombing, which people also imagine is contributing to the sheer level of destruction, would also be out of the question. Nukes are expensive and limited, and chances are a lot of them will get shot down before they hit their target. Those targets most likely being vital economic and political centers, as well as large population concentrations and enemy missile sites. Meaning multiple nukes will be dedicated to striking only a select few strategic targets, also not accounting for the fact that the enemy might be striking not only you, but your allies. In the case of Russia, this doesn't matter as much, and a full onslaught of the previously mentioned targets can be expected, and vice versa for the US attacking Russia and its allies. However, in the case of everyone who isn't the US and Russia, they would essentially need to deplete their entire nuclear arsenals for almost a single shot per target. They'd need to be more selective about where they will be attacking, likely ruling out high population cities or areas deemed to be unimportant. Too bad, NYC, you're still on the chopping block. Also taking into consideration the range of every nuclear power, you find that while the greater powers of the US, Russia, UK, France, and China can for the most part strike just about anywhere with the occasional exception of say New Zealand, South America, and Greenland, the other nuclear powers of Israel, Pakistan, India, and North Korea are believed to have a very limited range near exclusive to their own regions, with North Korea probably the longest reaching of the four somehow with an estimated range of 5,600 miles, while the others remain below 2,000 miles in their range. It's also important to note that we've significantly reduced our nuclear arsenals since the peak of the Cold War. You see, the more I picked apart the misunderstandings of a hypothetical nuclear war, the more I asked myself, what if a nuclear war actually happened? It would of course depend on when and why, as there are multiple points in time to choose from. I'll do an in-depth analysis about a general nuclear war situation, and then go into brief detail about the particular events such as the Cuban Missile Crisis, Korean War, Soviet False Alarm, etc, etc. Whatever the situation will be assuming that a cataclysm of some sort following increased political tensions triggers a nuclear exchange. In all likelihood, the responsible party will be one of the smaller players, as the large players don't have much to gain but quite a bit to lose. Perhaps a dirty bomb is used in an act of terror in Israel, perhaps India and Pakistan exchange fire over geographic disputes, maybe Korea decides it's just had enough of everybody. Whatever the case, a small nuclear power takes action, pulling its allies and the allies of its opponents into direct retaliation. Missile defense systems do great work in stopping several of the incoming warheads, but in most of these nations they aren't nearly advanced enough to stop the vast majority from hitting their marks. 
The most severely impacted nations would of course be those with a high population density and a small geographic size, that being North Korea, Israel, and Britain. Similarly, allied lands who also fit this description are also at great risk, most notably Japan, the Philippines, Taiwan, Greece, and more. These lands, because of their dense populations concentrated in small regions, are devastated. The impacts of nukes in major cities being likely to radiate out to surrounding sparsely populated areas and leaving the nations with only fragments of a surviving population. The bulk of survivors being irradiated or burned and likely to pass away within weeks or months. Now we move on to medium-sized targets with dense populations such as France, India, and Pakistan. The latter two being each other's greatest enemies are likely to expend most of their arsenal on each other. France and India have the advantage of an overall dense population with little land left unoccupied. This could be an issue for France if it needs to face the onslaught of the USSR or Russia depending on the time period, which it likely will. You'd assume a nation with a dense population would have some survivors left over, but if France needs to face off a massive power like the USSR or Russia again, there'd be little hesitation in just wiping out as much of that high population as possible. India, however, so long as it need not face a massive arsenal like that of Russia or the US, would eventually be able to repopulate and rebuild lost areas, but that high population could still work to their disadvantage, as it may lead to a balkanization of the nation following the loss of central government and the bombardment. India is a pretty big and diverse place, and that could lead to some division in the absence of a cohesive government. France most likely sees a great devastation to its urban areas alongside destruction of non-urban governments, leaving it in a state of chaos and disorder until a new government could be established. India, if it faces the same form of attack, would likely divide along the lines of a new government, which would arise post-war. The US, Russia, and China fall into a similar grouping of having a vast, sparsely occupied lands, but dense population concentrations. For the US, it's in the east and west coasts, as well as surrounding the Great Lakes. While for Russia, it's the west, and in China, it's the east. China is probably the largest outlier of these three, possessing a relatively small arsenal while being bold enough to house a heft of its population in tightly packed areas. An attack on China may prove to be the most devastating in terms of casualties in the entire war. See, with India, the nation isn't exactly in the crosshairs of the US or Russia. However, China has historically proven to be an aggressive and formidable power, whose relationship to both can be described as strained and complicated. As such, the US or Russia have much more opportunity to strike multiple targets within China, thanks to their larger arsenals, and no matter which targets are hit, a massive loss is almost guaranteed, due to China's massive population being packed in densely concentrated cities. The US and Russia, if they come head to head, would be each other's worst adversaries. In a multi-thousand nuke situation, they could successfully eradicate every major population center known missile site and political hub in each other's lands. As devastating and crippling as this would be, a large population would still survive within each country, many of whom would likely remain unradiated and uninjured simply because of how vast these two countries are. The issue is that these populations would be spread out and few in grouping. Whole towns and even counties would survive untouched by the war, but were now disconnected and without higher governance, so it looks like we've gotten the bulk of the bombs out of the way. What comes next? I know what most of you are thinking, nuclear winter. Well, as it turns out, nuclear winter may not be as realistic a prediction as we thought. The idea was that so many high-powered blasts would propel ash and debris into the stratosphere, where theoretically they would remain and block out the sun, leaving us in a hyperfreeze leading to crop failure, starvation, etc. However, we now know from further testing such a thing is unlikely, especially today as we've gradually decreased the yields of our warheads. Russia supposedly still has about 10 whose yield is still capable of propelling debris into the stratosphere, but these wouldn't be anywhere near enough to trigger a nuclear winter. A temporary blocking out of the sun is still possible, however, but nowhere near as long as the supposed nuclear winter would suggest, mostly fading after a few days and likely completely clearing after two weeks. During this two-week period, the fallout of the explosions would be carried by the weather and spread across the continents involved, primarily along coastlines, and may lead to some dangerous weather phenomenon, such as irradiated twisters and radiation storms. The best prepared will be able to easily ride out these two weeks from the comfort of a bunker or shelter, while others would need to hide out indoors and ration their food and water. Those unlucky enough to be caught without shelter or forced to gather resources in the fallout risk heavy radiation as the air will be full of radioactive fallout particles, which they'll now be breathing in and carrying on their clothes and skin. There are some regions that might also be entirely untouched by the nukes in the fallout, but this would all depend on payload and wind. A test in Bikini Atoll of a weapon several times the yield we use today showed fallout travel nearly 300 miles from ground zero in a span of only 96 hours. This was, however, the largest yield bomb the US ever tested, but the current Chinese yield is still a third of that. 
If we were to select a winner for this war in a competition of survival, India would probably come out on top, with the US close behind thanks to its widely spread population. Russia and Pakistan, while their populations are concentrated in one geographic direction, still have a vast area of unirradiated land to work with. China and France would lose a terribly high count of their population and some of their most valuable lands. Finally, Britain, Israel, and North Korea, if some semblance of them still exists, would be far beyond repair. The populations of these lands would most certainly be devastated and what remains of them would be forced to flee elsewhere or risk radiation poisoning and starvation. The world is shaken to its core in a war more deadly than the two great wars, yet having lasted but a week. However, the world survives. Humanity carries on. The continents of Africa, Australia, and South America are grossly untouched by the effects of the nukes. Greenland, Canada, and Scandinavia become safe havens for American, Russian, and British refugees, while the French flee to Switzerland, Spain, and Italy. Everyone else stays home to rebuild. Martial law in the US would certainly bring some cohesion to parts of the country, but given that the survivors of the war would likely be those accustomed to small government in isolation, particularly in well-armed states, we'd likely see the rise of smaller nations in New England, Cascadia, and the Midwest. And the same could go for Russia, a division of the state into East, South, and West. China and India too could break up in a number of different ways. Notable other states that get caught up in the attack again include Japan, South Korea, the Philippines, Greece, Turkey, Germany, Benelux, and Taiwan. The world in the aftermath would be drastically changed. Economic power would shift from Western Europe, the US and China, to the remnant EU of Eastern Europe and Scandinavia, Brazil, and Indonesia. As I said before, India is the most likely to fully recover from the war and may take China's role as a world economic power, but with the coasts of the US and China greatly irradiated, they won't be playing a large role internationally anytime soon. If Germany, Japan, South Korea, and Turkey survive the war, theirs would become the world's new dominant militaries and likely become the states their neighbors would rally behind and turn to for defense, though fragments of the US and China could certainly re-emerge as dominant military powers in a similar way Russia had following the collapse of the USSR. Now had this gone down in the 50s during the Korean War, the Soviets had only just started testing their bombs while the US arsenal is estimated to have been in the range of 300. There was potential for nukes to be used in Korea to create a nuclear no man's land and prevent Chinese support in the region. Regardless, it was never done, but it could have set a precedent between the US and USSR that could have led to a similar tactic being implemented by the Soviets in Cuba sometime later and potentially escalating conflicts further. Had the Cuban Missile Crisis heated up, the Soviets had more than just the officially declared nukes in Cuba to use against the US and would have been able to hit major targets in Texas, Florida, New York, and even California. NATO, of course, would retaliate and inflict the same upon the Soviets, who in turn blast out the nations of Western Europe, potentially sparking an invasion of West Germany if the Soviet government survives and initiating World War III. The US at the time had a much larger nuclear arsenal and could have well put the Soviets down for good, ending the conflict in a devastating blaze and later decommissioning their own weapons to never be used again. The 70s also had their own Cuban Missile Crisis in the form of the Poplar Tree Incident, one which could have begun an even more devastating conflict than that which was previously mentioned, now involving China who could strike US allied Japan, Philippines, and South Korea. Once again, if Soviet leadership survives, what follows is an invasion of Western Europe and a potential reconquest of China by Taiwan. By this point in time, the Soviets are very capable of completely obliterating the UK and France, and nuclear winter is a possible outcome. And though the US still holds the upper hand in terms of number, neither side would enjoy the outcome of this conflict. By the 80s, the Soviets were nearing 35,000 high-yield warheads, while the US was beginning to reduce its own numbers. If the 1983 Soviet false alarm was acted upon and the US retaliated in response, both powers had the capability to annihilate each other, their allies, and potentially trigger a nuclear winter once again. And it would have been around this point that we could have seen the worst possible outcome for nuclear war. Today, we only have a fraction of the nuclear arsenals we once possessed. In terms of quantity and capability, our nukes have been nerfed significantly, but nukes are also much more widespread. Almost just as concerning, knowledge of nuclear power is even more widespread, meaning the potential for weapon development. My initial analysis in this video is best applied to where we are today. The biggest danger in the past was a misunderstanding between the US and USSR, pulling all their allies into war. But today, with a huge increase in globalization, interventionism, and spread of nuclear knowledge, that danger could come from a conflict between India and Pakistan, it could erupt from Israel fearing the development of nukes by Iran or some other Middle Eastern power, and even from North Korea acting in a belligerent manner toward its neighbors. Yes, nuclear war will be devastating, but it won't leave us fighting with sticks and stones as the expression goes. It'll just be a new revolution of warfare. 
Imagine a conflict with the same devastation as World War I, encapsulated in only a few days. How quickly fights could be over in what some might consider a more humane manner than the brutality of war. If nukes became cleaner, smaller, and more widespread, then it kind of becomes inevitable because mutually assured destruction is no longer a fear, it's just a faster, more effective destruction. If, following the Great Nuclear War in this timeline, the new global powers don't decide to do away with nuclear weapons entirely, then we can likely expect not a repeat, but an improvement, a more deadly and precise improvement in warfare. So when people ask, what if nuclear war happened? I tell them, not much would change. Because war, war never changes. The US of Z thanks you for watching. Support your legion by liking the video, or join our ranks by subscribing for more. Mr. Z. Out.